Please make welcome Tolif Foggy Hat. Sorry, Foghain. <laughs> Hello, I'm here to talk a little bit about Secrety, which is a, it's a prototype for storing and distributing secrets. Um, first, let's see, there. Uh, I'm working for Fastly, we run a CDN. Uh, you're probably using us, um, though hopefully you don't know it, because that means we've done something bad. Um, we're hiring for people in technical and non-technical roles, so if you think that this being thing content is interesting, then come find me or look at the website. Um, so the problem we're looking at here, um, <coughs> sorry, um, code can in some cases be secret. It's, there is proprietary software out there. We don't like it, of course, but um, sometimes you don't want that distributed. Um, configuration can be secret. There are some organizations which publish their, publish their configurations. Debian comes to mind. The Puppet repository there is public. Same for GNOME. Um, there are probably more, but not that many. However, what basically nobody does is they don't publish their credentials. You don't publish your API keys, your database passwords, that kind of stuff, because that would be kind of bad. Um, all of these things need some level of protection. You need to protect code from unauthorized modification. Of course, the same thing for configuration, and, and same for credentials. Credentials also needs that protection from just the disclosure. But your machines, they need this information because else your app can't connect to your database and whatever other kinds of secrets you're, you're disputing. TLS secret keys, API keys, passwords, whatever. Um, most projects, whether they're actual software projects or they're more of a an infrastructure project go through this, this evolution where you start out where you hard code your database password in the code. Eventually, after you check this in to get and then publish it, you stop doing that because you know that's bad. So you put it into a configuration file instead. And then you, you check in the configuration file to get and publish that. And the second time you do that, you you think that, okay, I'll move that configuration to something which isn't managing Git at least. In some cases, you then end up with multiple machines, and so you need a way to take your database password and distribute it to your various app servers. So for this, well, you know, you'll have it, either you'll do it by hand, and eventually you get tired of doing it by hand, um, and then you put it in a GPG encrypted, oops, uh, a GPG encrypted file, which, and you have GPG keys per, per machine, um, and you store, you just store that in Git and publish it somewhere, because if somebody can break GPG, there are more interesting things than your database passwords. Um, this has certain problems with it. Um, your engineering laptops will suddenly have a copy of your various production credentials on them. So that PCI compliance might mean that somebody steals your laptop and you have to rotate all your API keys and all your database passwords. Which, you know, is kind of tedious. So <clears throat> it's better to then end up with a situation where you uh, you store your secrets in some kind of online store. A service you, where, where your machines can go and say, hello, I'd like the database password, please. Um, of these, secret is an instant of the last one. There are some others, I'm going to, to mention them. Um, 
The problem with most other existing stores is that so they're either complex or they're insecure. A bunch of them are using, uh, they're reusing credentials like SH keys or Chef access keys. They're basically reusing keys which are used for signatures as encryption keys. And this is, this might not be bad. It kind of depends on how you use the various keys. In a bunch of cases, it's certainly bad. Um, so it's, if, you, if you ask people who actually know about crypto, they'll say, well, don't do that. It's, it's a bad idea. Use different keys for that. Um, another problem with them is that they often don't have good support for development environments, so that you end up with having the same set of passwords available to your development environment as, as your production environment, which again gives you the problem of somebody steals your laptop and you need to rotate all the keys. Um, there is often manual work to re-encrypt if you have all your, all your passwords in, in a GPG encrypted file. You add a new server, you need to re-encrypt that. Um, this, especially when you're, when you're building lots of infrastructure, this is a lot of work. And GPG isn't, uh, it's presumably pretty, crypto-wise, it's pretty good. UI-wise, it's not so good, and it's really hard to build good interfaces around GPG. It, it's not designed for embedding into a library. And, and that comes into the last, last bit as well. Updating is hard. You need to push this, this out. Um, so we need a better tool. Uh, this is a tool, so I started working on this about a year ago where we were using, uh, we were using a tool called PV Store at the time, which it's the moral equivalent of a directory with GPG files. Uh, so we needed something where we could have a service which ran inside a development environment, not an IDE development environment, but in terms of we had the various, um, we had the various LXCs in our case running the app server, the, the database service, and so on. So it needed some sort of dynamic environment support. Uh, together with that, you you kind of want the central storage, so it's it's a single service for a particular environment. Because we bootstrap new machines, we wanted to have policy-based access controls so that we can say, here's a new cache server, here's a new app server. And they will magi well, magically, or automatically at least, get access to the secrets they needed. Having good APIs for updating is also helpful. Um, the, the, central, the central storage uh, is also because of the PCI requirements. So that Whatever is in production is you don't have that on your, your laptop. So we, because of what we do, we run a CDN. We have a good bunch of machines around the globe. We bootstrap machines basically every single day. Uh, we needed a solution which supported hardware bootstrapping and rebootstrapping easily. Um, if you have something which requires manual work there, it, you, you end up spending a lot of engineering time just doing the, the reboot strapping and reboot strapping. Similar, we needed it to be able to do, to, to do its job without some, a human sitting there uh, watching what's going on. Because we handle financial data, not directly, but it sometimes passes through servers, we needed the, the audit control, controls that are required by PCI. Another concern about the, the reboot strapping is that 
when we reboot Strapi machines, we, we don't run on VMs, we run on physical infrastructure, which means that we burn a machine to the ground and build a new one. So you don't have any persistent storage across from one instance of a machine to the next instance of the same machine. So we needed something where we could, even though it doesn't have any storage, we wanted something where we could potentially at least use the TPM for authenticating a, a machine as being the same as a machine which had already been there. So about a year ago, when we started on this, uh, there were a few, couple of, few options out there. Uh, PV Store is it's a tool which came out of Debian, uh, used by the Debian sysadmin team. It's a you have a Git repository with a bunch of files which are JPG encrypted, and you have a thin layer, layer layering language on top, where you can say this group has access to these files, this group has access to these files, so you you can limit access somewhat. Um, there's Chef Walt, which uses, so we use Chef for configuration management. Uh, Chef Walt, it reuses the, the Chef, so for the authentication model in Chef is that you have an HTTP request and in a couple of magic headers you do an RSA signature of the request, so every node has its own secret key, which is known by the Chef server. It, or the, the public key is known by the chef server. Um, so it, it, there it reuses that key for authenticating or for encryption. So you encrypt to the public key of the node. And then it also has, has a mechanism so that you can, you can limit which nodes have, has access to what. Uh, about a year ago also HashiCorp Vault came out which is a fairly comprehensive solution for, for the problem. Uh, it wasn't really mature a year ago, so we didn't, if it was, I probably wouldn't be standing here talking about secret D. Uh, it's, today, it's a pretty, pretty solid solution. Um, it has deployment complexity, so it kind of depends on your use case as well, whether you're willing to put up with, uh, with that level of complexity. So today, um, you can you can I mean this the same things exist. Uh, you have PV Store, you have Chef Vault. They're re encrypt they're pre encrypted so that your your secrets are going to you're going to do that manual work or have a cron job which does the manual work of re re encrypting those secrets. Um, it might not be a problem. You have Tools like etsd, um, if, you, if you use that, you have to take up the work of, of a CI infrastructure in X509. I'm not a particularly big fan of X509 and, all, and the entire PKI, PKI model around that, so not for me. Um, Hashcop World, Vault has, it's distributed, so you can, you can run multiple machines around the world, uh, distribute secrets. Uh, it has complexity. Com complexity associated with it. Uh, it also has a really interesting concept where you go, could I have the database password? And there's a TTL associated with that. So you can say, it, it, it will tell you, yeah, sure, here's the database password. It's valid for one hour. And then within that hour, you'll have to go back and say, you know, could I have the database password? And then, so it, it provides a mechanism for easy, easy rotation of of the various uh, secrets, which is sometimes really important. Um, it has interesting mechanisms for, for bootstrapping hosts where you have, you basically need two different keys to bootstrap. So there, you, there's one key which you can embed in your, uh, in your chef cookbooks or whatever, and there's another key which you then provide through some other mechanism. Part of the reason why I don't like X509 X, X is that it's so easy to get wrong. If you, if you run an older version of SOCAT, it doesn't validate the CN by default. S, S tunnel doesn't necessarily validate CNs by, CNs by default. 
And if you use OpenSSL's S client, it doesn't do IPv6. So. OK, so I sat down and wrote an initial implementation of security in about a week. It's written in Go. I'm a big fan of Postgres, so it uses SQL and it uses the mechanism, like it uses some semi-advanced features in SQL for, for doing some of the, the bits it does. Authentication tends to be kind of hard, so I figured that and, and it, in Debian we use, we use SSH triggers, so for if we have two hosts which need to synchronize somehow, so you can then go, a, a machine can ask another machine to, to update itself. So th by using the stage force command, you can tell it that this key will automatically run this other command. And this is quite powerful. Secrets are conceptually a tree structure, and you add ACLs at various points of the tree. So you have you have a root, you can have whatever you structure you want. Keys are, they're just strings, nothing magic about them. Uh, as I said, it's using Postgres as, as the backend, and it's free software, it's Apache licensed. Um, so the, the, the architecture is something like this, where you have a client, it talks to the server over SSH. SSH forks off a small tool called Secret Shell, which talks to the actual daemon over a Unix socket. The format going over that Unix socket is JSON, and the reason for that is that it, it makes it fairly easy to audit that it's, it's using the, the Go serialization and deserialization libraries, so it's, it's, it provides an interface which is hard to do buffer overflows or do kind of do bad things over. Um, it's, in a way, it's modeled after the, the X architecture where you go, here's a message of this type, and then whatever fields. But I mean, it's, it's not a binary protocol, it's, it's a text-based protocol. Before, because really, performance here isn't much of a concern. Secretly, in turn, talks to Postgres over a TCP socket or a Unix socket. Um, the SSH is, as I said, only used for authentication. It doesn't do any authorization. So it doesn't, it will just say, it will just connect to, it will tell Secret Shell, here is user A, and they have requested this, this action. Um, the database structure is pretty trivial. We have a set of principles, or clients or users or what you want to call them. Uh, they are member, members of groups. Groups have, groups have access to, they can be granted access to something through an ACL. And secrets are connected to ACLs. There, are also, there is also a field here, here called ACL types so that you, could, you can give people write access without giving them read access or the other way around or you can give them both. Um, so it's, it's, I'm, try, I'm trying here to do it as kind of a minimal solution and solving not as little of the problem as possible but solving enough of the problem but not too much. Of course, there's, there's missing bets. Uh, it, somewhat embarrassingly, it doesn't, it doesn't yet encrypt the secrets on disk. Uh, I haven't gotten around to writing the code to do so. It's going to use the libsodium wrapper for Go, uh, where it will, because the secrets in the database are just a byte array, you can just say, Put this, put this secret in here. It doesn't really have any, the admin tools are kind of, kind of primitive. It doesn't, the model supports other UIs. So if we look back here, you can easily add something else talking over the Unix socket. Then, then sorry, uh, yeah. Something else talking over the Unix socket, like a web UI or something like that. But 
so far I haven't read that. Um, it doesn't yet have the audit bits. Uh, it it needs needs adding that uh, both on the database side, so you can you get logs about who changed what, but also logs about who accessed accessed what secret when. Uh, there is very little in the, in the way of tool integration. There is no libraries for accessing this from Puppet or Chef or Ansible or whatever. It, it, it's only accessible over, over SSH. Um, it also doesn't have, sorry, it also doesn't have the, the uh, TPM integration. And the last bit is an enrollment key, which is an idea I, I shamelessly stole from Chef, where you have a key which acts as an, a key you use to introduce yourself. So it's a key which only allows you to sign up as a new principal. And the neat trick I'm, I, the database has support for there is that you can pre-provision, so you can you can say this this principle is going to access. We're going to stand up, you know, these ten machines. So we'll pre-create them in the database, but we'll mark them as they don't have an SSH key yet. So you can then show up with the validation key and say, "Hello, I'm Cash One Two Three," and assuming that isn't enrolled yet, it will get enrolled with that SSH key and it will get access, because it exists in the database, you can grant, grant uh, permissions to it, so it will then magically have access to all the secrets it, it needs. Okay, um, because there's been so many good live de demos here, I thought I would tempt fate and see if I could make a live demo work as well. So let's see if I can find that window first. So, okay. Do it like that. Okay. So here we have we have a couple of, of different uh, different shells. We have one which is just running. Uh, it's, can you even read that? Let's see. That should be readable-ish, shouldn't it? Okay, so we have one shell which is logged in as the user which is running secretly. Uh, I'm going to run some admin commands there. We have this other one which is actually running secretly now, but I'll, I'll stop that. So it's, it, it's using a a really neat tool which came out of the Postgres community, which is uh, PG Virtualen, which gives you, it's really useful when you're doing testing and for doing, uh, doing integration testing and unit testing and everything. It will run a command in an environment where it has just spun up a, a Postgres database. So it runs, and then it says, you know, it will start. It will start that Postgres session, and then it runs a PSQL command to populate the the database with uh, kind of the the bits you need at the start, because else you don't really have anything to uh, you don't have an admin user and so on, which is kind of tedious. Okay, so let's see. Now here we have we have an SH key. Uh, so what we're going to do is we'll, we'll start by enrolling this key. Oops, that's a bit too much. Let's see if I manage to copy. That's also a bit too much. Ah, there. Okay, so in the admin shell here, we'll do uh, 
run the secret shell. So the secret shell, can, you can either tell it to look at the commands to use from, from the SSH original command, which is an environment variable which is set by SSH whenever you use force command. So you can use force command and then force SSH to execute a specific command, but at the same time let you know what the original command was. So let's not do that one, but let's do this one, which is the same SSH key. So let's enroll. So here I, I'm telling it that I'm the, the admin principal and that it should enroll the user, the LCA 2016 user, with this key. As you can see, there's still some debugging information. So it tells us this seemed to, seemed to go well. And if we look at the SSH bit, it will tell us that, yes, it, it returned, it gave back a enroll reply message with the action and the status being, OK, this went well. Um, yeah, we'll also do and we'll also create another uh, another user. Let me find. Sorry, that one. So we'll. I'm not going to give that user an SSH key. Just foo, foo as their kind of empty SSH key. Um, that's next year's LCA, which also enrolled final course. Now, ACLs are applied on, on, on groups. So what we need to do now is we need to create a group. So we'll create a, uh, let's see, group.create. So we'll create a users group. OK, group created. No debug information even. And here, again, it just, it dumps out a bunch of debug information. It went well. Um, then we need to add add the user to the group. So we add, uh, let's see, yes. Again, we're still doing this as the admin user because while you can do while you can access the the service as the LTI 2016 user, it doesn't have any permissions yet. It doesn't. It's not a member of any groups, and also there are no secrets in the database, so it's not particularly interesting at this point. So, created a group. Uh, let's see. And then we need to just create an empty secret so that you can, you can have values at any point in the tree, but you can also ACLs also are applied to, to the various points in the tree. So you need to, uh, you need ad, as admin user, because that has admin access, you need to, to create the node as the admin user first. So we'll just create a, a passwords node. And then we can, I'm just setting it to the empty string. And then we can do, we can do secret get passwords, and it should give us back an empty string. Right. OK, but what we can do instead is that we can um, yes, and then we do the then we allow the LTA 2016 user to actually write to that that bit by doing ACL set group whatever node. OK, bit, bit of debug uh, permission set. So now we can access this over SH. And then we can do secret.put. It helps if I spell correctly. So we'll put the Wi Fi password in and put that in. So now it will tell us here that it got the message to action is secret.put and the password is LCA20, uh, the path is password LCA2016 and the actual password is LCA by the bay. And then we can fetch it again. So, so this is over SH, 
SH to localhost, and hooray, we got the Wi-Fi password back. Excellent. Did the enroll action update your dot authorized keys? Or? Yes. So the question here is is uh, whether the enroll action updated the authorized key, and the answer to that is yes. I, I failed to show that. Uh, if you show so. Um, if I print out the authorized keys, it will show you, so the format here, let's see if I have the mouse pointed there, is that you can, tell, you can tell SSH that this user shouldn't be able to forward, forward agent, it shouldn't be able to allocate a PTY, it shouldn't be able to do X11 forwarding, uh, no user RC, it's basically lock this down as much as you ca can and then run this particular command, home secret, secret D, bin secret, shell, with principal LCA 2617 for, for that particular SSH key. So, so when, it, when it gets run, it pulls some of the signature commands off, which is passed through, but things like principal get overridden. Yes, so, so the question is, uh, uh, what secret shell will do with the, what it will do when executed. And it, because it's run here with the, the flag double dash SSH, the last bit here, it knows that it's being run from the authorized keys file, and, and it then will look at the SSH original command, and then use that for parsing anything but the, it will look at the principle from the original command line, but it will look at the actions and everything else from uh, from the, the, the environment variable. And I didn't show that it actually enrolled this, but it yes, it will. It will if I enroll. I mean, we can do 2018, just a new one, and then you see it adds that to the end. So it always generates this file. Okay, um, so before we get to questions, we, oh, let's see if I can move, there. So before we have questions, we have answers. Should you use security today? No, don't use it. It's, it's not finished. Uh, just earlier this week, I found a bug where it didn't check access control properly, so you were, anybody were able to put a secret. It, it absolutely needs more tests. It needs, uh, it's, it's a hole in the free software ecosystem is that if you do anything semi-complicated in, in SQL, it actually, like, there are very, very few testing tools. There's basically no testing tools for unit testing of SQL schemas. There's, like, two of them, but I didn't like their designs, and I'd rather not write my own. So if somebody else wants to write, write that, that would be excellent. Um, yes, so questions? Why Postgres instead of SQLite? It looks like you only have one client talking to the database. That's one fewer moving part. Because I wanted a database and not an SQL interface to a flat file, basically. Uh, Postgres has actual data types. It has, uh, it, for some of these things, so for, because it's conceptually a tree structure, uh, your database needs to support features like common table expressions where you can, uh, it's, it's not a super advanced SQL uh, feature, but it's a feature where you can, you can do recursive queries into a database, so you can, you can actually store a tree structure by saying the parent of this node is this other node in the same table. And I, I, SQLite used not to support it. I'm not sure if it does today, but it certainly didn't before. And it also doesn't really have data type support, or at least didn't last time I looked at it. So it's, SQLite is excellent for some things, but for, for this, it's, I'd rather have a, a real SQL database. Um. Sorry, on the yeah. on the slide where you had the uh, the, the schema uh, drawn out, 
the, uh, it strikes me that the, the four relations you've got on the left there, you're essentially re-implementing the uh, uh, authentication and access mechanisms that are built into Postgres. Um, I'm just curious, with the, with the advent of uh, row-specific uh, privileges in Postgres 9.5, which was released fairly recently, have you considered uh, simplifying it to use uh, Postgres is built in authentication and, and authorization, which would leave you with an exceedingly simple to test schema of only one relation. Uh, given that they didn't exist a year ago, uh, I obviously couldn't use them a year ago. Um, that requires you to actually to have those users exist as, as database users, I believe, does that? So in, in that case, every you would end up having lots of database users, which is not really how people seem to, to tend to solve this. Uh, sure, I, I, I absolutely agree with you that it's re, kind of reinventing the wheel there. Um, and no, I haven't really looked at the, at the role level security before. Hello. Uh, yeah. Over here. Um. So I'm just wondering, uh, how do you protect the SSH private key on the host? On you mean on, on the host enrolling itself to like that the, the host being bootstrapped or the host fetching the secret? Communicates over SSH. Yeah. I mean, in so, either case, it needs a private key. Uh, is do you have some mechanism to protect that? So it, it turns out that. If you look at your, your machine, if it runs SSH, it already has a private key. And it's stored in ads SSH. And you, you can perfectly well use the SSH uh, host key. Because in a uh, let's, oh, sorry, say key. You can use that file for SSHing out. And because we use Chef for, uh, for our configuration management, we also take that key and store it into the Chef server. So we have a mechanism for taking that out of the system and then storing it in a central, in a central store. Uh, so basically, in, in most cases, as long as you run this as root, then I would actually use that key because it, it already exists. And you don't have, if that becomes insecure, you need to look at how you manage your systems. Hey, uh, you said there's not a feature just yet, but why would you worry about storing stuff uh, encrypted into the database instead of just using an encrypted volume? Because I, I want to make it so that it's, it's harder to leak. I don't want... So in, in some cases you can... If you misconfigure Postgres, you'll end up storing storing SQL queries, for instance. And it's, it's one of those, it's, it's better for the database not to know than for the database to know it. So by, by moving that, uh, the database doesn't have to know it, so there's no reason for it. So it's, it's more of the limit, the limit where it, it's exposed to not. And also it means that if you have it unencrypted, your you, you need to make sure that your backups are encrypted, right? So there, suddenly there's your, your attack surface becomes a lot bigger, and avoiding that is, is good. Are you looking at um, ways of distributing the authorized keys file or something so that it can be run more horizontally scalable rather than the single machine point of failure? I've been thinking about how to do it. Uh, I'm thinking there that, so you can, you can use built-in replication in Postgres, so that gives you some level of, of high availability or what you want to call it. Um, but yeah, you also probably want to then periodically just regenerate the, the, the key or have a trigger which does it for you. Um, it's, it's another unknown, well, less known feature of Postgres is that it actually has a mes message bus built in where you can, on one end, you can, you can listen and then you can, you, can you can listen for a particular signal and you can then generate that from a different connection. Um, it's a completely different project I'm hacking on which is called PG Listener where I'm using that for generating 
uh, user databases on various hosts whenever there is an update. So um, you can probably probably use that and then generate a message and then run that uh, run the, the generation command on multiple hosts. Yes. One more. Hi, me again. Uh, you mentioned that there's a PCI DSS requirement to not store the keys uh, on the target machines. Uh, does that include if the keys are encrypted? How much do you trust your encryption? Right. It, it's one of those. Uh, I, I, like, I'm not a lawyer and, and all of that. I'm not giving you any kind of advice in that respect, but if I were to lose a laptop with production keys on it, I would try to get those keys revoked and changed. Yes, I would. Even though, yes, my machine is encrypted and everything, but that doesn't mean that, you know, there are attacks where you can steal crypto keys out of, of DEMS, as long as it's not powered off. So, do you want to risk your business on people not being willing to do that. It depends on whether there's somebody stealing your laptop to sell it off on the nearest corner or whether somebody is doing a, a industrial espionage. And so that really depends on like what's your attack model, what you're trying to, to defend against. And also, of course, how expensive is it for you to have to regenerate those, those keys. So in, in that case, it's, it's better just to not have them on the laptop because if you don't have them, it's really hard to steal them off the laptop. Okay, thanks. Tyler, thank you for an interesting presentation. On behalf of LCA, thank you very kindly. Thank you.